Hello, dear friends. Today, in the Alatra TV studio, we have the esteemed Igor Mihailovich Danilov. Greetings. And also Jana. Greetings. Today, we would like to talk about an explainable phenomena, about that which in the modern world cannot be explained by either science or, seemingly, by human logic. About those gaps in the knowledge which don't allow studying and explaining certain phenomena. As it is known, if there is no knowledge, if there are no facts, then one has to rely on blind faith. And it is precisely faith without knowledge that gives rise to certain doubts. And the system supports such an interest in the topic of parapsychology and paranormal phenomena exactly through this very faith. And when you ask people questions regarding what they think about paranormal phenomena and unexplainable phenomena in their life, they often say that, yes, I believe that there is something in it. But it is totally unclear what this something is. And here you wonder, for the sake of what do people actually spend so much effort and time? And is this worth it? And so today we would like to try to sort these questions out. However, in addition to the questions about unexplainable phenomena, we receive a lot of questions with a request to expand on some topics. In particular, in the previous programs, we asked you questions from viewers on the topic of microchipping and biometrics, and you gave answers to them. And it is interesting that a letter has also come now with such a request to clarify, let's say, certain points. Specifically, it's a question about microchipping and modern technologies. The entire material world, along with its technologies, is controlled by Lucifer, and he acts through the consciousness of his slaves. And, as the saints said, the Antichrist will put his mark by means of his technologies. First, there will be electronic cords, and in the end, there will be marks. The saints used to say that these technologies will affect consciousness in such a way that those people who will be marked will see images in their consciousness, which an ordinary person doesn't see because his consciousness is free from these technologies. May I ask a question right away? Where is this said? And what saints mention this regarding microchipping? That this mustn't be done, that this is bad? What do they refer to, and who do they refer to? To John the Theologian, precisely. Wait a minute. When was John the Theologian writing his… Revelation. Revelation. When? And what did he write? Guys, microchips mustn't be put, right? And one mustn't get an individual code, this tax number. Did he write this? The taxpayer identification number, yes. A simple question. What was said by John the Theologian in this regard? I will read out. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And now I'm explaining to those who have understanding. Point one, either, or, or. Point two, on the right hand or on the forehead. And where did John the theologian take this? And what time was actually meant? What makes you think that it's about our future? future in his understanding. After all, there are many versions. About our time or our future, when this will be introduced. And did he say, don't do this? Did he say, there mustn't be a biometric passports? There mustn't be microchipping? Is that what he said? No. Electronic. He said, on the right hand or on the forehead, either there or there. Where did this come from? Hebrews of that time had bands both on their foreheads and on their left hands. This indicated that they were Hebrews. Meaning, in the literal sense of the word, I'll just give a simple example for understanding of why he introduced this. Firstly, it's a direct opposition. The left hand and the right hand. The left hand was considered good and a band had to be exactly on it so that it would be clear who he was and what he was, especially while performing some prayer actions or something else. They put on these bands in order for everyone to see that they were not strangers. He introduced this practice in a directly opposite way. 
that the devil will force one to wear a bandage on the right hand, where either Satan's name or his number or something else will be written. What have they clung to? To numbers. Well, guys, you have numbers on your cars, you have numbers in your passports, we have numbers everywhere. It's an individual number, this way. It is simple and convenient to understand who, what and after whom. So this brings an elementary order. However, John, the theologian, didn't talk about the future, he talked about his time. It was trite politics. If we analyze all this in detail and compare to that time, he talked exactly about those times when the Romans imposed their power on them, and these seven heads and the like of demons. Emperors. All this was certainly said about the emperors, about those times. And thus the public was just inclined in order to oppose them somehow. Everyone defends their power and their terms. Yet, why does this predominate so much in the heads of, pardon me, people who are believers? After all, mostly those people are against who believe in God and belong to certain denominations. And why is this being imposed? Well, by no means I want to offend anyone among the believers or something else. I just want to explain, and for an explanation, I will say in a somewhat allegorical manner why they incline people referring to John the theologian, referring to some saints who supposedly said this. They lived God knows when, and each of them interpreted it in relation to their time, as it was convenient for them. This is banal manipulation of your consciousness, or someone's consciousness over your consciousness. In order for you to believe in this, while in actual fact, this is needed only for those who conceal their lies, dirt and falsehood. Let me give you an example that has absolutely nothing to do with religion. For instance, there is a group of people who have a respected someone, let's put it this way, who has come down from Nibiru, or as they say, Nibiru, right? Many also, I say Nibiru, why? While they say Nibiru. Well, we had a program on this subject. So, for example, there's a respected representative from Nibiru, or Nubiru, and there's a group of people who respect him. However, since this respected one resides on his planet, which is far away, there are his representatives here and people are trying to please him. And these representatives say, he likes it when you pay him tribute. You have to donate at least 10% of your income to him. Then he will talk to his Anunnaki on your behalf, kind of make a deal with them so that everything is good for you in the future. And if anything happens, that you are the one who will be taken away from this planet, which is crumbling or something else, well, you'll have some privileges. And so people believe in this and bring him tribute. Yet, since they cannot pass it on to the respected one, they give it to the intermediaries and hope that they will pass it on. And they say, so John Smith sends $10 to you. For example, an intermediary passes it on to the respected Anunnaki. And the person lives worry-free because he has paid his tribute once a month or once a year on some holiday. And everything is fine. The person is at peace and everything's okay. However, there appears such a topic as microchipping, where all sorts of income are transparent, and such a society emerges where there are no secrets. Well, literally, there are no secrets. All the banking activity is available on the internet. A simple example. For instance, a person, well, you want to find out how much I earn, where I spend, no problem whatsoever. You do a search and see, but why should I be ashamed? Pardon me. If I work honestly, earn honestly, I don't mistreat anyone, don't take anything away from anybody, I spend it where I want, well, she has found out or you have found out, so what? What will happen to me? Nothing. Isn't that so? What kind of a secret is that if I buy certain goods, those which you might not prefer, but I like them? Well, or vice versa. Well, there is no secret here. Nothing bad of any kind. Yet, it turns out that, what does this technology give? This very group of people who pass on the tribute to the respected Anunnaki via intermediaries, they see that these intermediaries don't pass anything on to the respected Anunnaki. They just spend it on themselves. It turns out they haven't worked a day, haven't lifted a finger, 
but only pull the wool over the eyes of this group of people. It turns out that these people, hoping that they have paid and as if have bought something good for themselves from the Anunnaki, haven't bought anything in fact. The intermediaries totally deceived them. They bought houses for themselves, they bought themselves property that they weren't entitled to at all. After all, they are intermediaries, intermediaries between people and the respected one. They should live in caves, use candles, and subsist on grasshoppers and the Holy Spirit, right? Whereas it turns out that they spend your funds, well, not yours, I mean the funds of this society, literally on their own life. Crooks. And what happens? See, in this life, a person thinks that they are so well off because… Of course, people get offended. Well, how come? What kind of… So they will ask, why haven't you passed it on? But how can they pass it on? Where are those intermediaries? They are the same as you, near you. And where are the Anunnaki? They are on their own planet, God knows where. So how can they pass it on? That's where the conflict arises. In order for this group of people, God forbid, not to find out where they actually spend the funds which people pass on to the respected Anunnaki, these intermediaries tell them, God forbid, after all, even the theologian said, no microchipping at all, not any, you will be watched, they will know everything about you, you will be controlled. I have such a simple question, and who are you? Are you James Bond? Who needs to hide everything? Do you take anything away or steal from anyone? Are you killers who should… who get money or something else for killing a person? Well, those people who engage in this kind of activity, yes, they do have something to hide. They live and work against society. And while working against society, while doing something bad to society, they, pardon me, do good for themselves. They have something to hide. And for them, this interest exists. The same as these intermediaries, absolutely, they have something to hide. But what do we, ordinary people, have to hide? A simple question. So, what does this microchipping do? Microchipping gives precisely the understanding of who spends what and where. It brings all this out of the shadows. But microchipping as such doesn't mean influencing your consciousness or something else. It's all of your documents, your passports, your bank card, it's all there in a microchip which you have. They say, someone will go ahead and erase something. Guys, as long as you delegate your power to someone else, as long as someone decides for you how you should live and which side of the bed to get up on, of course these things shouldn't be done. Why? Because it's a tool for manipulating you. But we talked in the previous program precisely about a new, creative, and constructive society, the one where people have recalled that it is written in the Constitution that all power belongs to them. When they stop shifting responsibility to someone else, I emphasize, to someone else, the one who will work for himself, not for you, will be telling you only before you, well, before you delegate your power to him. He will be telling you that he does everything for you and lives only for you. Guys, who thinks of anyone else when living and being controlled by consciousness? They pretend, but they live and work for themselves, then for their family and relatives, then for their friends who sing praises of them. Well, and in the last place, when there is a little bit of time left, when they think about the fact that the time will come and you will again have to choose whom to give your power to, then they do a little bit for you as well. Isn't it so? Well, this is honest, this is true. What country doesn't have this? It's everywhere like that. Whereas, we've been talking precisely about a new creative and constructive society where people, again, hypothetically, we have allowed for such a possibility. Having imagined that there is a community, people who have decided that power should belong to people and there should be electronic democracy, right? meaning where people openly decide on all the issues where, pardon me, they don't delegate power to anyone else, but simply appoint executives who openly, absolutely openly, do their job for a salary. But if, God forbid, some corruption happens or anything else, and since all this is apparent, it should all be absolutely open, no secrets whatsoever, there should be nothing. The slightest failure by a person to perform his job 
Well, excuse me, a person is simply replaced and made responsible for his actions. Meaning, if he has tried to undertake some kind of corruption or anything else, or to get rich at the expense of society, well, this should of course be punished in such a way that others wouldn't dare do the same. Meaning, openly and honestly, the way it should be. Truly, the way it should be. Well, in such a community, what threat will there be to you from this microchipping? No threat. If everything is honest, if everything is right, if you make a decision, not someone else, is it hard to open a gadget, read questions once a week about some laws and express your opinion, whether that's acceptable for you or not? Such an elementary electronic democracy resolves everything. Well, there are a lot of such examples, and let's say in some countries it does work, and why not expand it worldwide? It's impossible to do it in a single country, but it's quite possible for the whole world to do it. You are people. After all, if you want to, you will do it. But if you don't want to, you won't do it. While in today's world, of course, microchipping is a tool for manipulating both you and any other person. It's natural that in our time the introduction of such technologies is additional. Let's say, shackles for an ordinary person. Not because the theologian or some saint said so, not because the devil rules or someone else, Guys, whom does the devil not rule? A simple question. Images in the head, yes. Are modern technologies needed, right? Those very images, those very thoughts. What is any electronic technology for if he is sitting in your head? If the majority, well, the overwhelming majority, almost all people believe that their self is just a substitution made by those very demons. That is, they call demons their self. Because they think like this, they experience emotions, they live like this, and they perceive it as their self. So a demon literally lives instead of them. Sometimes a person does something and understands what he does, he feels, while feeling is that very personality, who a human exactly is. He feels that he's doing wrong, but he keeps doing it. A simple question, why does a person keep doing this? After all, just go ahead and reject it. No. He is doing it, because consciousness has decided and told him so. Yet, who is this consciousness? There are just so many people who even… But they are afraid of microchips. They are afraid. What do I want to say? That it's not the fault of those intermediaries of yours, not yours, I'm sorry, but of this community, which we have given as an example, purely in such an imaginative way. These very intermediaries between society and the Anunnaki are not to blame. They are just people like you, and they are just like this community. They have managed to steal, and they steal. Anyone will steal. Take anyone from this community, put them here. They will live the same way, those who are controlled by consciousness. And it's the community itself that is to blame, because it has put intermediaries, because it has decided that it is possible to buy something from the Anunnaki. Why? The Anunnaki don't have money. They have no such concept as an exchange coin. We have it because we are wild. And we are really very retarded. We still have money. We have, pardon me, authorities. And we have borders. We have a lot of things which developed and socially adapted people should no longer have had in the 21st century. This good filter you're talking about, this honesty and openness, is a good filter to check who is really responsible and wants to serve society and people. The filter is good, but it's extremely inconvenient. That's the problem, you see. This filter is inconvenient because there will be no one to serve in society. Each other. Yes. I'd like to touch upon the fact how much people are manipulated by consciousness, even from the experience of what happens in the movement. There also arise situations when people come and, against the background of mysticism and some kind of sacred knowledge known only to them, they begin to agitate people, referring to the fact that you have given a certain mission, that Igor Mikhailovich said so and he said it only to me and entrusted me… The chosen ones, right? Yes, such kind of chosen ones. And it turns out that they sort of lead away… And everything comes down to magic with half words. To magic, yes. Well, of course. Again, they pretend to be who? These very intermediaries. Intermediaries, right. Well, guys, what's the problem? Well, everything is actually open, and it's all clear here. 
And there's no magic, in fact. In Alatra, there cannot be. That's why these secret groups are established and some trusting relationships are formed and people get disappointed afterwards. And why? Naturally, because people go to these secret communities to learn magic. Yes. Well, magic, we have already discussed it. Why do people need magic? In order to learn to influence someone, in order to... Power. Right? To attain power over someone. Real power is very tempting because it gives you opportunities to steal a lot of money. You get your hands kissed and you are respected. You know that nobody respects you. They hate you, but they pretend to respect you. And such a hype is created. Well, it's the retinue that makes the king. Well, the retinue is you and me. So before you scold the king, spit in your own eyes. That would be right and honest. And again, the thirst for secret power. After all, the most tempting thing for a human is secret power. When you have power, an opportunity to change something, to create something about which no one will know that it is you, but if someone has offended you, you will, so to say, cast dysentery on this person, which is not cured by any medicine, and then you will laugh with pleasure. Haven't such thoughts come to your head, guys? Now, many will say, no, no, consciousness throws in one and the same thing to everyone in certain life circumstances. And in everyone, it encourages the desire of power, the desire to possess something magical, supernatural, not to serve the society, not to serve the spiritual world, but simply to create an empire for themselves. Not even to create an empire, but to have power in order to punish those whom you dislike. Someone has scolded you in the marketplace, someone, pardon me, stepped on your foot in a public bus, so let all his hair fall out. Well, is this normal? Right. There are even cases like this from the experience we've had recently, when a person just wanted to influence, well, having come across the knowledge, when some power already appeared, the power that is given for spiritual feats, the power that is given for service, meaning sort of an entrusted power, if we may say so. And Remember Jesus' parable of the vineyard tenants? Yes, and there was such a situation that there was a football championship, and the man just wanted to influence the outcome of the game. That is, just an idea came that it would be good if this person scored a goal now, and it worked out. Exactly this person. Exactly this person. Right now. So that it would happen right at a particular minute. And the person simply made an insertion, meaning he put his power of attention there, and so it happened. The next insertion that he decided to make was to have another person do the same thing after a while, meaning to score a goal to the gate So, two. he picked a particular person again. He picked a particular person again, picked a particular minute, and the same thing happened again. What did he need this for? Here's a simple question. In order to make sure whether it works or not, right? Yes, exactly. To test his abilities, meaning, did it work out, or was it just a coincidence, or is it… Again, yes, he was wondering, does the power work or not? After all, he is embarking on the path of service, right? I certainly know this story, and it's not the only one we have. The question is not about that. The point is that consciousness dictates to him. He succumbs to this provocation from consciousness, and he gets convinced of the power he possesses. That he has it in him that he can immediately influence. Yes, but this elevates him so much, and he immediately, he influences the situation online. He doesn't think about how many people lost because of him. Such a scam. Well, how many disappointments, right? Bookmaker bets, someone put it in the last money, hoping to win, and here's his interest, banal curiosity. And he lets masses of people down. If any of our people play around, we'll name them on the air. That's interesting. I'm kidding, of course. Is it actually his power? Right. Why? And here, Tatiana has exactly given the correct answer. Yes, right. It wasn't him who used the power, but the system made fun of him. It has a written scenario in the material world, and that is precisely used by many predictors and the like. They talk about, or rather the system talks about its plans through them like through a megaphone. It is actually talkative and tells a lot. And in such a way, a person predicts what will happen. And this happens. 
And in this case, when a person engages in spiritual work on himself with the goal of not just achieving spiritual liberation, but ultimately serving the society, people in the spiritual world, and at this point, the system suggests to him, you have to make sure, after all, you do feel the power, and you do feel that you can do something. Yet, how can you make sure? Very simply, look, there's an online game. It's okay, yes, literally, just a little bit. It's okay, of course, you are just influencing. You just choose, here, the 11th, the 7th, number is running. Now, let him score a goal, let's say, within two minutes. It's a trifle, it will not affect anyone. And the man scores, consciousness says, no, well, it's a coincidence. You could just, you are watching the game, and you know that this player is strong. Let's check. Don't take the 7th, take the 11th number. Let the 11th number score the goal in three minutes. Three minutes later, the 11th number scores. Consciousness says, well done, you have the power. Statistics are needed. Now do it again so that you can make sure completely. Once again, a man scores a goal and everything happens. Consciousness says, well, you are a Buddha, almost. In order for you to make sure that you are a Buddha, you need to do something else. Let's do the following. You will be driving. If you see, let's say, an overturned red car in which two people have died, that means you are a Buddha. And if you see a white car, you are still not quite Buddha. You still have to work. And the person is driving and sees either a red or a white car. It cannot happen so that he would see neither a red nor a white car while driving. That's how the system works. But, as a matter of fact, the system has it all written down. The system knows who will score what and at which minute, because all this is a chess game with itself, with the distribution of moves. The system knows which car, where, and for whom it is time to leave. It's the system's world, it's the system's game, it's the devil's world, and he is the prince here. However, such people who are not quite stable on their spiritual path, who are unsteady and prone to temptations, who haven't grown up and become a strong rival for it. The system begins to knock down such people and lure them into the games of magic. Again, the thirst for power, which comes from consciousness, is in the person himself. This is a substitution of what? A substitution of what personality strives for. After all, personality of every person, and every person knows that. Having removed superficial stupidity, he can become a part of the spiritual world. And what is the spiritual world? The spiritual world is precisely those angels who are capable of creating worlds. In the literal sense of the word, our world didn't appear just like that. It would seem they create worlds out of nothing. But, is it really out of nothing? Once, we gave an example of a chamomile. A simple example. Imagine a chamomile in your mind. Imagine there's a chamomile flower, and now forget about it. It is just as easy and simple for the spiritual world to create our material worlds, in which there are lots of galaxies, planets, and everything else, and we are running around here. And to create conditions for us to mature, for us to choose. After all, freedom of choice was given to a human for a reason. And that very devil was given, was created for a reason. Many people compare the devil with God as if they are equal in strength and they fight. Guys, the whole world is an illusion. It is everything that disappears instantly compared to the spiritual world, which is stable and which is eternal. Our consciousness is unable to perceive simple, elementary things. What the boundless world is, which has always been and will always be, it is stable, there are no shadows in it. This is incomprehensible for us. Our consciousness lives in the shadow, in a mass of reflections, in all these illusions, and it lives a very short period of time. Our entire material universe exists less than one instant, generally speaking. It's not by the way, where's the chamomile in your head, guys? Just in the same way, all our worlds disappear. But when you were imagining it, it existed. Everything is very simple. Tell me, 
Since there was a chamomile, all kinds of little bugs and spiders could live in it. They could live their own lives. And for them, it was a whole life. And for your chamomile, it was a whole life. Whereas for you, it was just an instant which has passed and you forgot about it. If I haven't reminded, you wouldn't remember. Here's a comparison. But while our chamomile in the form of our world still exist, and the prince exists in it, he is the one who creates conditions which we must step over in order to be worthy of that world. After all, water never flows under settled stones. Consciousness often says, don't do anything, especially in religions. Pray, they will do it for you. Like there is the Holy Spirit, accumulate it. Just like Oblomov, keep lying on the couch, accumulate, and it will all be done by itself for you. Nothing will be done. If a person does nothing, nothing will happen. It's impossible to achieve anything by doing nothing. Igor Mihailovich, you have also said that every person as personality really feels that spirit is much stronger than matter. It appears that the system distorts this understanding and suggests an idea that a human should rule over matter by means of magic. But people do feel this. People feel that. Again, why do they feel? At the level of personality, they know that, in fact, matter has to be subordinate and obeys those very forces which personality has a connection with. I mean, the spiritual world and the like. However, again, consciousness twists everything into a desire of manipulation, into desires that come from the system itself. And sometimes it even creates such conditions where a person falls into illusion. And it seems to him that he is the one who influences something. As a matter of fact, the system can play even more serious things. It's also interesting that it turns out that every person feels inside, one way or another, that some unfolding of a miraculous power has to happen inside him during this lifetime. However, it doesn't unfold in everyone. Many do feel there are no people who don't feel, let's say, that there is a certain power. There are no such atheists. Pardon me, whether they are healthy or sick, no matter what we call them, but all people feel. Some of them, yes, they immerse themselves in consciousness so much and push themselves away from these forces so much from this entire mysticism, simply being afraid. It is fear, fear that drives them off. Nothing turns people into atheists except the inner fear of the reality of God's existence. Why? Because as soon as a person understands and begins to learn, moreover, if he learns that there is God, this makes the person change his entire lifestyle imposed by the system. It's not his lifestyle. Actors live instead of him. But the actors are against changing their lifestyle, so to say. I'll give a simple example. Imagine you are actors, and you are too. You have a sufficient salary, you work a little and live well. You are just lucky and suddenly they tell you, you must work hard, you will be paid ten times less. Will you like that? And you, just honestly. Not really, right? And so, will they resist? Well, you would resist too, wouldn't you? You would say, how come? I'll search for another job somewhere. Yet, it's us in this life who will search for another job, while our actors in the head cannot find another job. Pardon me, it is sort of difficult for them to change the stage. Therefore, they have to resign themselves to the producer, to the director, and the like. But they will rebel. Right. I'm just recall the states which arise in childhood when there is an understanding that the reality disappears completely, meaning it's like breaking away from matter, like breaking away from consciousness. That is, it's a loss of such a… well, such an impression arises as if you get alienated from matter and simply feel a state of some freedom and some sort of weightlessness and space. It's interesting that in psychiatry there are moments when people describe that, in principle, the reality which seemed to be reality to them, at some moment, space thickens and they observe this world through some sort of a thin pellicle. And this world loses its colors, this world becomes fake, absolutely artificial, totally unrealistic, black and white, and they themselves basically lose an emotional attitude to this. And this syndrome is called derealization. 
What are such phenomena in actual fact? The thing is that they are encountered not only by… Everyone. Everyone, yes. All people encounter them at a certain age, in one or another situation. Right. Yet, many try to shake their head and immediately get out, get away from it as a delusion. What is the point? As we already explained, primary consciousness is responsible for the connection with three-dimensionality, precisely with secondary consciousness as well. It is responsible to personality. Personality doesn't perceive the three-dimensional world in any way. It perceives it from the perspective of at least the sixth dimension. It is all completely different. Well, in different tones and different colors, let's put it this way. However, when there are moments of some inspiration or weakening of primary consciousness, then people perceive this illusory world more realistically, and everything begins like in the Matrix movie. And far and wide people happen to encounter the fact that the world is illusory. There even comes perception and understanding, all embracing understanding. Yet later on, even at the level of consciousness, they begin to interpret this at the level of primary consciousness. But as soon as secondary consciousness interferes, everything disappears, and it all immediately falls into its place. It begins to tell a person, you imagined it, or something else. However, there are often such moments as well when people can provoke this state. That is, by switching off secondary consciousness reducing the power of attention paid to the primary one and giving freedom to personality. They can, so to say, look straight at this world more freely. And then this effect occurs. The observer position, to observe oneself. Absolutely right, yes, and the world gets distorted. Well, this is a rare phenomenon, especially if it often happens in childhood. You, the Anunnaki, have it developed since childhood, since birth, just by nature. You actually perceive the world a little bit differently in general. Whereas people, they… it happens that those who are predisposed, whose personality has more spiritual power, so to say. And all this depends primarily not so much on the gift which people have, but also on education at the same time. A simple example. Excuse me, a person was born in a family in which he was either oppressed or, on the contrary, could get away with anything. So, this environment makes it possible for personality to develop more strongly or less. But what is happening in our world? We actively develop consciousness. Primary consciousness, secondary consciousness, I, me, myself, yours, mine, you cannot go here, here you can be, and so on, and so forth. That is, an oppressed person actively develops consciousness, but doesn't develop personality. And here, of course, the dominance of consciousness over personality occurs. And it's hard for that person not only to break through or to have such phenomena even when they occur spontaneously, well, due to certain circumstances. It's hard for him to even understand what it is. It scares. And if it starts happening more often, people end up in mental institutions because their consciousness says, you are sick, you need treatment. And consciousness is not interested in these manifestations, neither the primary nor the secondary one. And, of course, all this is supported in a person by means of consciousness. Panic attacks begin in all sorts of severe neuroses and everything else, and the person ends up in psychiatry. Although this is normal, it's a natural phenomenon. Moreover, the system itself glitches. We've already talked about this. And the more spiritually free people appear, the more you, Guys, truly work on yourselves, not engage in fairy tales and games, not sit on somewhere and wait for something, but really work on yourselves, work spiritually, study the system itself, study yourselves, study consciousness, and not just study, but resist the bad and maintain the good. This is simple. Everything depends on where you pay your attention. The freedom of choice that is given, and the more a person starts, let's say, putting the power of his attention in the good, in the spiritual, in that which is useful for society, that is useful for him as personality, first and foremost, not for him as an illusion of him, meaning not for consciousness. The weaker the system will become and the more it will glitch, and it glitches all the time. It's only going to glitch more and more, and the glitches will be noticeable, and everyone will be able to see that. The system sometimes experiences very interesting glitches, there are, pardon me, even videos filmed on this subject and everything else. And it's not for nothing that many people say it's like in the Matrix movie. But the Matrix movie was also based on something. Surely. People observed, watched, saw, and so it 
hovering of objects in the air planes, but, however, cars collide with invisible obstacles. Well, this is natural. These are again glitches when personality is active. People appear and disappear. This also happens, of course. The system can also do such wonders that, as this world belongs to it. And these glitches are also related to the fact that there are more people following the spiritual path and people developing as personality, right? Well, I have just said, the more of them will emerge, the bigger the gap will be. Glitches will be greater. Why? It's like a hole in the net for it. It has to patch it up. While it patches it up, it takes away power from somewhere. And again, it's our inattention in the work of our consciousness and our brain. After all, the brain constantly fills something in, completes something. Consciousness fills in the blanks, and personality gets information that everything is fine. So, we practically don't see anything. Again, we see through primary consciousness, through the brain. They say the brain has thinking processes. Well, it doesn't have any. It's chemistry. It's an organ. Sorry, it has functions programmed for breathing, for a heartbeat, for chemistry, chemical reactions, and again, transformation of electrical signals into images, and images into electrical signals, and then it transmits them to other, let's say, types of energy, connected with personality. Nothing more than that. Here is also an interesting topic regarding the brain. What you have said, because for many people, self-development, there is such a substitution from the system, which is associated with the fact that you must become a superhuman. And in order to become this superhuman, you need to use all the capabilities of the brain. 100%. Not 5, 6, 10, as it is now, but 100%. Well, guys, again, the human brain is involved. And it is almost always involved, exactly as much as necessary. No matter how we stimulate it, no matter what we do to it, our intelligence won't increase. There were a lot of geniuses with small brains, pardon me, world geniuses, while their brain volume was smaller than that of an average person. People were found who were morons in the literal sense of the word, while at the autopsy his brain was twice as large as that of an ordinary person. With a big head, he should have been, pardon me, with an IQ of at least 250. But he was the most common moron who spent all his life on drinking and hanging out. He didn't need this. But again, why is that? Because his talent wasn't developing. After all, any person is talented. There are no untalented people. It's just that we often do not what we should do. And this is the trouble. So, due to certain circumstances, instead of doing what we want to do, we do completely different things. Or, on the contrary, we want to do exactly what we are not meant for, but we want to do it. Well, you looked at your friends and fellows or watched TV, well, it doesn't matter where this image emerged in you from, where consciousness got it from for suggesting it to you, and now it supports the idea that you must do exactly this. Let's simply take an example. In reality, we have only a few artists. While many people draw, there are only a few artists in the history of the world. But even those who are appointed the greatest artists and are praised to heaven, pardon me, with their painting, I would well, at best, cover a hole on the wall. You know, it's like in a play, as they say. We have a hole here. He says, so we covered it, right? Well, that very Picasso, I don't perceive that. Others see in it. Also, there is surrealism or something else. Others see in it beauty and insight. But someone doesn't see it, right? How come? Because you can make up a lot of things. We once discussed Malevich, Black Square, and many other things. Someone sees the highest genius in this. Well, they see, that's fine, thank God. However, life should be approached somehow more realistically, more correctly, without imposing empty things. When they praise and exalt artists who an adult draws like a child, well, guys, I understand, for an adult to draw like a child in such an ignorant and ugly manner, and to say that this is such greatness, well, that requires certain skills, of course. Igor Mihailovich, it would also be nice, since we touched upon such topics as paintings and artists, as well as various eras. In psychiatry, there is such a syndrome called the Stendhal Syndrome. What it involves is that people who visit certain places in Italy and get acquainted with the Renaissance period, the Renaissance era of antiquity, fall into various states after getting acquainted with these works of art. They are disoriented in space, and there can be some emotional states of euphoria, then in the same way there are some states of anxiety or despair. 
And these states often last for up to several days, and people actually have to be attended to get psychiatric aid, yes, by psychiatrists to get help. And in science, they don't know what it is and how. Why don't they know? Come on, everyone knows and everyone understands it all. It's just inconvenient to voice it. Well, who can admit that a painting can affect human psyche, right? After all, it's a painting, pardon me, it's just paints drawn on a canvas. So a person looks, well, there is a combination of colors. If a person is prone to some kind of disease, it can cause some aggravation in him, right? Well, actually, not in everyone. But when far and wide, the same paintings cause emotional breakdowns in people, then a certain correlation is already traced here, isn't it? And if there is some kind of correlation, then how come we are getting to metaphysics already, to some paranormal phenomenon? This is just a painting after all. Well, how can it be a peaceful drawing? Such an impact. But at the same time, it causes mental breakdowns in a person, right? Is this normal? They interpret it, of course, quite in different ways. In different ways As yes. a matter of fact, it's very simple. When a person, an artist, paints a picture, as a rule, he paints it during more than one day. In various psychological states completely reduce to zero the emotion of the painting itself. That is, when making certain imprints, he actually works, puts the power of his attention into the canvas, into the paint, and drawing all these lines of various kinds and the like, and he creates a common ensemble. He is charged with some kind of emotion. And so, when a painting was painted during a week or two, that is, a person approached it seven, ten, or twenty times in different states, then it bears nothing but some picture, an image. But when and at that time, it was fashionable to paint a picture in one go. So, why did people use various psychotropic drugs? There were mushrooms and roots and everything else. Then, later on, they started using absinthe. What for? For a painting to be made in one impulse. And these paintings, one impulse paintings, meaning an emotion that was transmitted and embedded at one time, naturally, it carries the same emotion that was embedded into it because it is not overlapped with anything else. And here, when people begin to resonate, they look and it enters them. Firstly, there appears what the artist wanted to say, and they focus on the painting itself, and put their attention. As soon as the person resonates, he receives the same state in which the artist was, the one who painted. Well, this is a banal pattern, and there is nothing special about that. But, therefore, we admit paranormal phenomena. So, we are getting involved in parapsychology or metaphysics, and thus, we must recognize scientifically that, yes, such a phenomenon may exist, but we cannot scientifically verify it. After all, excuse me, thousands of patients who find themselves visiting the doctors because of the same paintings. In the same states, right. What is that? Is that a trifle? This is not proof? Unscientific. Unscientific. Yes, but they say that it's a predisposition of people themselves. Whereas unscientific, well, yes, people's predisposition, of course, people's sure. People's predisposition that there is simply a certain percentage of people who, due to such a superior art, which expresses such beauty... It just blows their mind, as people say, right? Yes, exactly. And they actually interpret this as a compliment to the artist, that this is so great that such paintings simply make people faint. Of course. Pardon me, not only back then, but even nowadays, there are not only works of art, but also, let's say, musical compositions. When they are performed, especially when they are performed by the authors, when this theme is made under the influence of some hard narcotic substances which provoke hallucinations, intense and hard emotional experiences, and a person has created that himself, and again, being under the influence of psychotropic substances, he performs, provoking this state in himself. What do we see? Masses of people who fall. In the same way. Into the same states. These are sober people. They haven't taken anything, but they enter the same state. And again, whom do they also need later on? Those very psychiatrists, in order for them to use other drugs for suppressing this phenomenon and impact. Well, isn't that so? Doesn't this exist? There are lots of such cases. If we look at statistics, well, to tell the truth, this statistics is not being recorded thoroughly. It's not interesting. Why? Because it proves a certain influence from the outside. It's much easier to explain the way Jana has just said that there is a certain percentage of not quite normal people who experience such strong emotions because of high art. It influences them. They get such a psychological trauma and so, 
which later on gets settled in a certain mental disorder. Right. In the same way, it is also interpreted that those who suffer from schizophrenia illnesses, they also have a sort of misperception of both the products of art and those very songs, music. Well, recently we had a program about schizophrenia, where we discussed what it is. Let's not go back to that. Yet it's easier to attribute many unexplainable things to people's illnesses, even without understanding what this illness is. Yes. Or simply to say this doesn't exist, it's a coincidence. So what? If it has recurred thousands of times, well, it's a coincidence, it happens. Yes. Anything can happen, right? Many things happen in the science. The topic has been raised today regarding paintings and creativity, and some creative people say the following when they explain why they embed negativity in their creative work. They sometimes say that the negativity which they experience, the pressure they feel, they begin to embed all this and they feel better they feel better why right because they have shared their negativity with us and later on when we look at their paintings we feel worse because we share the state of these artists thank god there are only a few such artists in history who are really able to embed or rather were able to embed their mental states again it doesn't come from the holy spirit Believe me, it's the work of the system and its servants, demons. Well, indeed, it is their need, just like maniacs. A good, wonderful man and all that, but a third power comes over him and he commits, excuse me, terrible crimes, but he is horrified by these crimes himself. Well, in the games of professionals, in the field of psychology, these topics were discussed. And this is indeed so, and many of them talked about it repented and so on, that they couldn't resist even these desires. The same is with artists. The state comes over them and they see and understand that if they don't create this image right now and exactly in this way, it will be hard for them. That's why they didn't sleep. That's why they used various drugs and alcohol in order to somehow let themselves free. But at the same time, they embedded all their negative state in these pictures. And then, as Tatiana has told us, various syndromes appear in psychiatry, the Stendhal syndrome, and everything else that cannot be explained. Why? Everything is very simple. After all, this is psychic energy. These are the states which are transferred into a certain object. Well, later on, people behold it. And if they even slightly resonate, Again, what does resonance with a piece of art mean? One goes a little deeper, puts his attention, and a response occurs. Well, a response through investment of our attention means that we get something that was embedded into it. Nothing more than that. Everything is very simple. Such things should simply be excluded, let's say, so that people don't see them. This is harmful to people. This way, evil is multiplied. And we raise them to the rank of expensive pieces of art. Well, this is already… Everything that is exclusive and sad is always expensive, pointless and unnecessary. Let's put it so. Here's another thing about the exclusive and sad. When we asked such a question, we said that something good could actually be created anyway. Those good feelings which you experience, you can invest them in your creativity. Sometimes you hear such an answer to this that, well, a drama also has some kind of its own beauty, its own colors. Well, again, of course, someone falls in love with Satan, even with Satan's image, as he is portrayed with horns and hooves. For them, it's an ultimate beauty and delight. Many choose serving Satan intentionally and consciously, and they believe that this way they please God. After all, pardon me, who is Satan and who is God? And people understand internally that Satan is, again, merely an instant of the thought of God Himself. But since God created him, hence he is needed. Since I will serve Satan, hence I will please God. And for this they gain a reward, which they, so to say, deserve subpersonality with all that it implies. If you serve the dead, you get the dead. If you serve the alive, you get the alive. Everything is simple and honest. It just turns out that consciousness also reasons that, well, it is necessary, on the contrary, to show this drama so that a person could compare and appreciate the beauty even more. Well, all this is actually… Certainly. 
Well, of course, that's why there are difficulties on the spiritual path, right? And what difficulty does any person have on the spiritual path? It's his consciousness. It is that very stone which is impossible for many people to step over. Whereas, in actual fact, you know, it is such a very small pebble which you won't even notice if you walk marching, and which is even impossible to stumble over if you are really filled with love and aspiration for serving God. But if you are shaky and egoist, if you enjoy, let's say, implementing all patterns of the system, then this small, unnoticeable pebble turns into an insurmountable and impregnable mountain. Everything depends on you, in fact. Therefore, you see how people can materialize things. They can both turn mountains into nothing and turn nothing into mountains. Everything depends on a person, on his choice, on his desire, on who he is, a human or an illusion. After all, as a matter of fact, the one who isn't born remains an illusion. Well, isn't that so? It is. It doesn't make it any easier for him, of course, but that's what he will deserve. It's just that how great is the responsibility of every person, even during the day, what he is doing, what his approach is, where he invests, the power of his attention, and what he invests, where he invests the power of his attention, and who he is and what he lives by, and how this will subsequently influence those people who… Well, if people thought about this, that would be wonderful, of course, but unfortunately… Right. Also, in the context of this topic, I'd like to touch upon such a phenomenon that nowadays there is treatment by means of putting a person into hypnosis and provoking his past lives to arise. This is called a method of regression to past lives. So, a person is put into a state of hypnosis and forced to recall supposedly previous lives. And the person tells something, making up stories and so yes, on. Yes, the person tells something about some problems which existed in his previous mm -hmm. life. Especially if a doctor has explained to him that he has a problem. Yes, surely. Of course. Probably in the past life, your wife hit you, he says, on your head with a frying pan. And because of that, you dislike women so much, don't you? Aggression arises, that's why you're an alcoholic, an adult, right? You just need to recall to live through it again. And this moment will abandon you. You'll become nice like a kitten, and everyone will love and respect you. Yet, does it help to resolve the situation? For the doctor, yes, it helps him financially. It's just so interesting. Well, for the patient, no. Let me explain. Even, let's say, in Hinduism, a lot is said about reincarnation, and in other religions there is a mention of reincarnation, reincarnation of the soul. However, for some reason, over time, they have made it up in such a way that it's you who get reincarnated. Guys, you live just once, you are personality. Personality has one chance, and there is no other chance. A person cannot live two or three lives. Yet, together with the soul, we already explained, whoever wants to will read a latra. A person gets reincarnated, but again, he is no longer capable of living, living a full life as personality, right? Well, I shall digress a little. Does personality actually live a full life in this world? It doesn't either. And here, two questions overlap, right? Well, just in order to explain simpler and clearer, having lived his life, a person becomes a subpersonality, meaning a satellite that is located near the soul. And it's the soul that gets reincarnated, but it's not you. You are that which is born once. It is personality. And for as long as you are personality, you have an opportunity to really gain life or to lose it. However, for some reason, it's being told, especially in Hinduism, that with every life you gain more and more experience, you accumulate, later on you will become a king, then you will even become a Buddha or something else. All this is nonsense. It is deception by consciousness itself. It doesn't let a person really follow the spiritual path in this life. It says, just be nice, listen to what I tell you, and then in the next life, it will be better for you, and later on, even much better. Well, and since a person doesn't remember and doesn't know his past life, a problem arises. Well, there are nuances. What needs to be done? After all, this practice of various regression regressions methods has existed a very long time. And in the past, shamans engaged in this. For ages and ages, the system has been manipulating such methods through consciousness in order to remind a person. For instance, there is a past life, something else. There are deja vu effects which have nothing to do with the past life, but they arise in a person. It's as if a confirmation that it is your reincarnation. 
Yet, if a person had lived, he would remember everything. He would accumulate a tremendous experience. He would become talented. In the past life, let's suppose you were, for instance, an artisan and molded pots. In this life, you could improve, you would learn to decorate these pots, okay? And pardon me, in the next life, you would learn to sell them. And so, perhaps you would become a normal... Okay, it was a joke. Well, I meant the talent would develop accordingly, right? Well, in actual fact, a human is born with a blank sheet and builds his own life. However, there are methods that can call, let's say, or awaken a sub-personality. Sometimes spontaneous awakening of those happen. Sometimes they dominate over the personality. But it's not reincarnation, it is still dead. Even if a sub-personality becomes more active than personality and lives, can this be called a person's reincarnation? No. Sub-personality is dead. It had one chance. It no longer has an option to become alive, not in any way. However, it can suppress personality and manifest itself as dominating. And so, the methods allowing, let's say, to call to a waking sub-personality, they actually differ from what these psychologists of modern times use. And the situation there is a little bit different. If a person saw all this from the position of personality, it would surely help him. Yes, there were cases when it helped a person very seriously to get out and start the right way of life, so to say, because he understood the prospects of the future. While in this case, it's a simple deception, a simple suggestion. So how does this happen? There's primary consciousness, there's secondary consciousness, and there's personality. Hypnosis is exactly when there is interference in supplying information, and it already goes to personality directly. That is lulled. Secondary consciousness is moved aside, whereas primary consciousness is slightly lulled. And that's where a third one can give an imprint. And then personality perceives. It doesn't perceive critically, in fact, it doesn't care. We already gave examples, and more than once. How does it perceive this world? What primary consciousness perceives is what personality perceives. Like today, it's John Smith. Tomorrow? Pardon me. Out of the blue, or by means of some external compulsion, primary consciousness, or the one who took its place before personality, there goes a flow of information that you are not John Smith anymore, but you are Smith John. Well, if it's Smith John, let it be Smith John. So in this case, Personality has no self-identification by name or anything else. Because in this case, personality isn't completely, let's say, subjectified. That is, it becomes whole only when complete merging of personality with the soul already takes place. That's when a name emerges indeed. That's when it has its own complete self. Whereas, before that moment, it is actually a little bit vague, so to say, well, there is a huge difference between perception of the sixth dimension and the third one. But in view of the fact that this world becomes the main and only one for it, and that information which comes from here goes only through consciousness, the primary one in this case, when it goes straight through the secondary one, well, it's a rare case. And in addition, this has very severe consequences when secondary consciousness bypasses the primary one, so to say. Let's take, for instance, sleep, okay? After all, the state of dreaming and various things that come true in it, plus dictation, when a person manipulates and controls a lucid controlled dream. After all, what is this in fact? It's the influence of secondary consciousness when the critical component of primary consciousness is weakened and secondary one begins to create God knows what kind of conditions. In a dream, a person might be anyone of the other gender and perceiving himself completely differently as an absolutely real thing. And all the mess and implausible stuff is perceived as absolutely logical, absolutely natural. And a person doesn't even experience rejection when, pardon me, for example, water flows do not downward but uphill. This is okay. When there is no gravity, he flies and he knows how to fly, and this is normal. This is experience. Many people wonder, how come I pushed off in my dream and I flew? I know how to fly. Does this mean a human can fly? Pardon me. Where does information come from, my friends? From the system, meaning from secondary consciousness. The system knows how to fly. For instance, a bird flies and all this is the system. Naturally, this experience is applied and transmitted. Just as a bird flies up, knowing and understanding in the same way this knowledge and understanding comes to you in a dream. Because a dream is a dream, it's a work of secondary consciousness. 
And we again go back to Freud and all the rest who tried to decipher. What does it mean? Nothing at all. They are messing with your head. In a dream. In dreams. Sure, this is brain work. They tried to hypothesize something. It gives something somewhere. It works in some way, but in fact, nothing works. It's hard to make consciousness work even during sleep. It is possible. You can discipline it. And during sleep, when you are asleep, it does some work and then gives you necessary information. However, you need to discipline it for that. You need to work very hard on that. While when it manipulates you and you work for it, for the system, pardon me, and for consciousness, then to expect from it that it will give you something good is stupid and unreasonable. It's just a waste of time and effort and an additional feeding of the system itself at your loss. Also in these dreams, and we wanted to talk about prescience too, that people want to foresee. Well, again, what is prescience, right? Well, it is looking into the future. Once again, it is striving to know what will happen. Well, we have already replied concerning this matter and also about all these predictors. Due to what does this work? Yes, certain people are given this capability when they really want it, or due to certain reasons. Let's say so. It's beneficial for the system to broadcast its programs through them. The system is talkative and it often voices what it wants. If people work on themselves, start seeing and understanding how consciousness works and what the system wants from them, why it manipulates them this way, or let's put it differently, what imprints come and people start noticing and eventually they see, hear and understand. The system tells them, I want you to do this so that it will be this way. But you understand that if it is this way, it won't be very beneficial for you. You say, no, this won't happen. The system says, okay, let's do it in a different way. So right up to the point where it starts bargaining. Well, is there anyone among those who really work on themselves who hasn't noticed that? Guys, and this is not crazy talk, this is absolute reality, this is work. Yet when a person is under control, the system already reigns here. It says that all this is nonsense, that paranormal stuff doesn't exist. If you want to be religious, go to religion and you'll be religious. Don't mess with your consciousness, you'll get lost. You'll get lost. There is also such a phenomenon here, prescience and predictions. So predictions, people draw such a gradation that there are predictions which are pleasing to God and there are predictions which are not pleasing to God. In people's understanding, there are those pleasing and not pleasing to God. If a saint who gives beneficial predictions is pleasing to the one in power, the one who decides this, and this is beneficial to him, then it is pleasing to God. Because for this person it is, whereas if it's non-beneficial and inconvenient, hence it's not pleasing to God. Let's say there was wolf messing. Everyone remembers, right? Hitler said that it was not pleasing to God because he foretold his loss. Well, Stalin said that it was God-pleasing. Well, guys, whether precognition exists or doesn't exist, whether fortune-telling exists or doesn't exist, there are so many facts that cannot be erased, right? For instance, how can you wave aside wolf messing? You cannot. This person actually existed and was doing a lot. Again, yes, the system was chattering through him and he could control that. Is he a saint? How can he be a saint? Pardon me. He was taking advantage of the moment, so to say. Yes, he himself admitted. The system was using him and he knew and understood this very well and he couldn't get rid of that, even more so. Yes, he said, I don't know how this happens. Let's take, well, since we've already touched upon Stalin and the like those times, let's take Maxim Gorky. Few people know this. He was a well-known person at that time. He's a world-famous writer and so on. Yet few people know that he was possessed. Few people know that he wanted to kill himself, to shoot himself down. However, those who do know, for instance, biographers try to justify that with some unrequited love, disappointment, young age, stupidity, and the like. What did he write in his note? While performing dissection, look where the devil is, whether I have a devil there. So it was the one who tormented him, that duality which he felt, which he couldn't get rid of. Eventually he made a deal with the devil and he became world famous. Did he have a wonderful life? He spent his whole life in wandering and the like. Well, in his time, he possessed certain power, even Stalin was afraid of him. He shot his own chest through. Again, he studied the structure of a human body, anatomy. Anatomy. He bought a gun, shot his heart, and missed the target, and hurt his lung. Well, what can be done? It's again a flunker. Who benefits from the fact that he missed as well, the system? A flunker is a flunker, just as he studied in the same way he lived his life. It's interesting that we have now started talking about Wolf Messing as well. And it's interesting that he described that what was happening to him in terms of reading thoughts, that there was nothing supernatural in it, that it was... It's not supernatural at all. Right. But again, those who, like the guys who really, let's say, go beyond selfishness, clearly, meaning they try to live not just for themselves, 
but to live wider for others and who already needed more serious practices. What do they encounter? All these manifestations. Is this difficult? Excuse me, when a yesterday's shepherd today becomes a person sort of... If he went to people with his supernatural abilities, I believe he would win any competitions among psychics. They actually have juggling and falsification everywhere. Whereas here, people can really do this. But why do they not use it in everyday life? Because they understand very well it is punishable. Again, why don't they do this? Because they understand very well that it's a direct way to subpersonality. Isn't that so? Yes, exactly. For instance, people who practice in groups also address us, meaning they discuss certain issues which they encounter. The fact that personality lives a certain short life term, right? While subpersonality suffers for hundreds or thousands of years. Well, this is sort of unfair. So people complain that. Wait, what does it mean, unfair? If a person, the life that was given to him, and during this time, he doesn't live from the position of personality, from the spiritual position, the way a person deserves to live, he betrays God. He chooses to serve Satan, to serve his earthly ego, and he becomes a sub-personality. And is it unfair that he will tumble for thousands of years as a sub-personality? What is unfair here? I don't understand. What is the worst thing that can be? It is betrayal of God. After all, everyone knows and everyone feels it. There are no people who don't feel that God exists. When does a person renounce God? When he betrays him. A child is born, he grows, and he feels that there is something. Any child feels that there is something. When he grows, he understands what is good and what is bad. However, it's good and right to do this way, but it's not beneficial for my ego, so I do this way. Meaning, he goes against his conscience goes against the spiritual and acts for the purpose of getting some profit, becoming rich, well, I don't know, pridefulness or something else. He acts badly, he betrays everything sacred, he does everything beneficial for himself in the material world for material purposes. It doesn't matter whether it is power, whether it is pridefulness, whether it is profit or some kind of stupidity, but the stupidity is dictated by whom? Again, it is coming from consciousness. Yet, any person feels and understands what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. However, it's more beneficial and convenient to do this way. A person acts so and betrays God, while a betrayal of God is punishable. And then he tries to justify himself. Then hatred for everything holy arises in him, and he renounces. God doesn't exist, only science exists. Here and now provide me with proofs that God exists, and I will believe. And who are you that God must prove anything to you when you felt and knew? Well, isn't that so? And because of this, he becomes a sub-personality. He has chosen this himself. He chooses his own path. He chooses hell. And the hell should be what? Excuse me. Personality lives, for example, a hundred years. He died. And for a hundred years, he can remain a sub-personality. And then there comes peace. What should he get peace for? For the fact that he betrayed God? For the fact that he killed an angel? And what is a person who has become a sub-personality? It is the hope of God that was betrayed to please Satan. And you have to face the truth. If you choose to serve the devil, you betray God. And for this, should he be merciful to you? After all, he is merciful, isn't he? He is merciful. He gave you a chance to live. But you chose death. You chose torment. You chose hell. What you choose is what you have received. Where is injustice here? Every person has the right to choose, and no one disputes his choice. After all, God doesn't interfere, excuse me, in human life. He doesn't interfere in a person's choice, does he? So it turns out that atheism is a lie to oneself, and everyone knows that there is God, right? Atheism is justification for one's selfishness. You prove it to me, and I will believe you. First, you prove that you are a human that you as personality are worthy of gaining life. And then you will get it if you prove this. Whereas if you don't prove it, you'll be a subpersonality. Everything is honest and fair. And then a human no longer has any questions. A subpersonality, not a human, 
because he doesn't become a human. And there aren't any questions anymore whether there is God or not. Having become a subpersonality, a person learns everything that there is God and that the devil exists. Right. There is also such a question. People have sent the question that, on the one hand, God never leaves a person, but on the other hand, God, as you have just said, He doesn't interfere. Prove to God that you are human and God will have faith in you. That is, God will see you of course. when you are mature spiritually. And so people are asking to clarify this point. How is that? Does He see or does He not see? On the one hand, God doesn't hear a person. Yes, exactly. But on the other hand, He… We have talked about this many times. God can neither hear nor see a person until He becomes a human. A person becomes a human, or an angel as we call it, only when personality merges with the soul. That's when he becomes an immortal being. We gave this example on people, fractally repeated actions. When, pardon me, mom and dad conceived a child, until he was conceived, they didn't know about the existence of either their egg cells or spermatosa. But when they have merged, when the child has already appeared, they begin to see, they begin to understand that life has been generated, and this life begins to form, and a person already comes into the world, right? The same is here. And what does it mean that God never leaves a person? Pardon me, but what about the soul? Human soul, human personality. Human personality, let's just say, is in two states simultaneously. It is both alive and dead, meaning it is both subpersonality and personality. Why subpersonality? After all, by its choice, again, from whom? As personality, he should form himself. He should grow exactly as personality. And what does the growth of personality mean? Here's another good question. I will digress a little. The closer personality is to the soul, the more mature it is. What does this mean? The more attention a person pays to his spiritual growth, the more he grows as a spiritual personality. The closer he gets, the more mature he becomes and the more is revealed to him. However, if a person lives by material interests, solely by material ones, solely by reasoning and not by perception through feelings, after all, everything is actually very simple. My friends, let's imagine that this table is divided into two halves. I'm not dividing them. I'm dividing only the table for your understanding. There's the left side and the right of me. For you, it's vice versa. Doesn't matter. This side is God's world and this side is Satan's world. And so a person chooses where it's more beneficial for him, where it's more interesting for him. He was born exactly with the choice of one or the other side. But when he is neither here nor there, here it's material. Here everything is clear, comprehensible, and explicable from the perspective of consciousness, of three-dimensionality. Yet, I'm saying it again, every person, even the most inveterate and impenitent atheist, in the beginning of his impenitence and complete denial of God, he always felt that there are two sides. There are both the spiritual world and the material world, meaning the inevitably dead one, the devil's world. And he always stood at the crossroads. But who chooses what? There are those who hesitate between here and there and don't come anywhere, but become subpersonality. Why? In order to gain life, you need to remain steadfast on the side of the spiritual world to serve God here. If you don't serve and don't do anything, you don't deny, but you don't do anything, you don't grow. Then you will inevitably get not a very good after-death fate anyway. But when a person makes his choice intentionally due to certain circumstances because he treated God, having heard so much from consciousness, having heard prompts from elsewhere that God owes you something, God isn't a genie. God doesn't owe anything to anyone and He doesn't do anything for anyone. He gave you the biggest and most important thing. He gave you a chance. However, again, consciousness says, if there is God, the world should also be good. Everything should be going well for you. He should take care of you. You shouldn't be ill. You shouldn't be poor or anything else. You shouldn't have any troubles at all. Well, isn't this so? This kind of God, yeah. If He existed, I would love Him. He would protect me and I would do whatever I want, live the way I want, and He would serve me. Doesn't this remind you the tale of the fisherman and the fish, like the old woman with the broken trowel, right? Indeed, when consciousness dictates, its need is endless. We have given an example exactly about the person who you've given an example about football. Yes, right. Today that let this number score a goal and so on. After all, consciousness will mock and torture one all the time, test and force one to serve. Mm -hmm. 
Isn't it so? Yes. Right. The devil is insatiable. And so, God is good when he serves the devil. Guys, are you in your right mind to even ask such questions? It's just, it seems completely illogical to me, even by the logic of the mind. God will never serve Satan and fulfill his desires. Because in God's understanding, Satan is an illusion. It is your chamomile. Remember? We talked about the chamomile at the beginning of the program. And why don't you serve? There is a small cockroach, it climbed there. Or there is a bug under your chamomile pistol somewhere, which you don't even remember anymore. And now it demands that you prove your existence. It demands that you give it more nectar, a soft bed, and invite a couple of these bugs. Then it would believe in you. Don't you find this funny? And why should God please the chamomile? And even worse, the bug. While these are even incomparable things, what I've given you now is an example. Well, it's material. It's such a big one. And imagine a huge number of worlds. And in these worlds, a huge number of galaxies. And in these galaxies, a huge number of chamomiles, which are full of bugs. And should God serve everyone? Is he your... Who do you think he is to you? It seems that Satan's megalomania is simply beyond the limit. And when a person succumbs to these impulses, the result is as follows. Isn't tumbling throughout centuries deserved when you exalt yourself to such heights? Who are you? What you've said is also an interesting example. Who are you, indeed? So the system narrows a person down to his own self to such an extent that he doesn't see how many traps are set by one situation. Of course. It doesn't narrow him down, it elevates him. Elevates. Elevates him to such a level that even God has to serve him. He has to prove something to him. And why? Because a person feels that he is here, he came to this world. Since he was born, since he is here, it means that everything is not for nothing. And whatever kind of support, denial of the existence of God or the world there is, well, something is wrong. I came here with some mission. What mission did any person come here with? To attain life, to become an angel. The only mission of a person is to become an angel, to become an immortal being, to become a part of the spiritual world. It's the only mission. Everything else in this world is meaningless, stupid and unrealistic, because it has nothing to do with the spiritual world. However, on the path of becoming, again, this is the path, and the path is the service. This is once again the work on oneself, and so on, right? Actually, they say it's difficult, but what is difficult? Don't serve Satan, and that's it. Don't forget about God. Strive for merging, and you will become one. For there is nothing easier. Live happily, rejoice, love, attain life while you exist, and it will remain with you. But when consciousness tells you, I want that, to act here like this, to deceive that person, to go there, to do some magic here, to make a wish here, and you keep financing it all, acquire the dead, fight for the dead, forgetting about the alive. But where is unfairness here? That you become a subpersonality. Right. In my opinion, this is more than fair. As if people have a lack of understanding that it's not just striving for the spiritual world, but that it must be a need, precisely a vital need. Of course. Meaning a vitally important need, like breathing. Absolutely right. Just as you correctly said in the programs that indeed a person, by sort of spending on all these desires, all these material pleasures, satisfaction of his egoism, all this mania… On empty things. On empty things, right. He spends his vital forces and he doesn't understand, meaning doesn't assess that he will pay for this exactly with a state of subpersonality. Certainly. Whatever a person achieved in this world, yes. it's all an illusion. And it doesn't give that joy. Right. For example, let's take a person striving for some power. And what is power? Let's take a closer look. Power and wealth is a ladder without supports. Not that stair which is between the floors with landings where you can stand and hold on the, to the banister for a while, but a usual ladder. Most ordinary one, as they say, a garden ladder, but without a support. And in order to climb this power ladder to please Satan, you try to keep your balance in the air and climb this ladder little by little. They say, in the pinnacle of power, what is it? 
The pinnacle of power is the top of the ladder, where there is even nothing for you to hold on to. And so you stand, trying to keep your balance, because you know, a wrong move, and you will fall down. Well, isn't it so, my friends? And the fall will be painful. It's just that in pursuit of these goals, people really do anything. They do, of course. Yes, there is this misunderstanding. But I do work on myself, right? I do live by the spiritual. Meaning, I spend some percent of spiritual practices, I attend some gatherings, I read spiritual literature. So it means that I'm getting closer to God. But they lose this understanding that it is life in every moment. Meaning, this choice that you should… Of course. Again, we come to what? To that which we have been accustomed to over the last six thousand years. Right. You come, light a candle, attend some, well, certain service, and then again you go to serve Satan. So, you don't even enter the left half of the table. You come in the middle here, there's your temple, regardless of your religion. You come here, pray, repent, ask God for more of something material, better for yourself, and you go back to serve Satan, right? Meaning, to live under his dictation. Whereas, what is gaining of life? Again, it means that even for a moment one doesn't part with the spiritual world. They say, this is actually hard, this is impossible. Wait, what is hard in living in joy, in love, and in happiness? Really, not to let go of it. Why do they say, how can we live in joy and happiness when our world is so complicated? Your world is complicated, my friends, because you live at this side, to the dictation of Satan. And when you start living in the spiritual world, you perfectly understand that this side of Satan is merely fuss. It is empty fuss, where everything passes. Everything passes here. Life flies by like an instant. It passes very quickly indeed. But this, the spiritual side, gives a constant feeling. What happens when a person gains life? Inside he loses the understanding of time. Why? Because even being in his body, he watches it getting old, wearing out and falling apart. It's like a driver. He drives a car and sees how it is gradually breaking down, and he understands that he needs a new one. But when a person gains life, he knows very well that, God willing, it stops sooner, and I don't need a new one anymore. Right. Because I've had enough. Yes, and as a matter of fact, in this state he understands that he doesn't refuse. He's simply not interested in this material world. He gets a completely different interest. Naturally. Well, in some people, consciousness starts saying, how to live. There are relatives, near and dear ones. That doesn't go anywhere. Your work doesn't go anywhere. And you need to take care of your body. We talked about this many times. And the concept of responsibility to relatives and close people remains. I emphasize the concept of responsibility. And nothing of this goes away, and it doesn't disappear anywhere, but you only spend 10% of attention on it all. And this is more than enough. And meanwhile, this attention is enough for the devil to serve God, but not God to serve the devil. That's the meaning of service, to force consciousness to be disciplined and work for you. Everything is simple. You accept some thoughts and don't accept others. It's like a radio. You turn on what you like, and if there is a program which you don't like, you turn it off and don't listen to it. This is just it, so… Why be indignant? After all, there come… Why be indignant, right? Yes, and who is indignant? Yes. Who is actually outraged? Actors. And who blasphemes against God, against everything? Most of all, he is in search and struggle, he is fighting, he is trying to prove the truth that God doesn't exist, that all this is nonsense. Yes, he waits energy and attention on this. Who, Satan? Yes. And who else is interested in this? No one. But the devil in one's head. Well, isn't it so? That's how the world is arranged. It is. Yet, why does the devil fight this way? Because he, the devil, fights for anyone, for any subpersonality. Why? Because this is his food. As a good owner, he fights for the health of his goat. It should be healthy and give plenty of milk. Then it's a good goat. If a goat is sick, what does he do? He treats it. So does the devil. As soon as a person even starts getting engaged in the spiritual, starts thinking about the spiritual, the owner immediately comes and starts treating him. And in the process of treatment, he begins to explain, it's impossible, it doesn't exist. Let them prove to you, let them give you. If you say that there is God, then let him do something for you. Let him show a miracle. Let him prove... God will prove his existence to Satan, it's a paradox. Also, Igor Mihailovich, people ask questions regarding personality and regarding the spiritual world. When a person becomes an angel, what happens to the person's personality? Is personality preserved? Or is it self-identification of any kind preserved, of this personality? What happens to a spermatozoan when merging with an egg cell takes place? Does the spermatozoan preserve its identity? 
or does some mutation occur? I'm just saying, this is fractal. There forms a new. However, here it's matter, while there it's at the level of the spirit. Well, what we are accustomed to express. I'm just saying, personality is dual. It is inevitably dead and alive at the same time. So, precisely, a person himself, as personality, has to choose what to finance, and he should aspire, and personality's aspiration is always directed to God. Yet consciousness always strives for what? For personality's death. Because it's beneficial for it, it's a goat, it's food for it. What will it do? It will do everything so that personality dies, in our understanding, so that it becomes a sub-personality, right? However, personality feels something different. Everyone feels when they listen carefully. What does consciousness start telling right away? Especially to those who feel by means of consciousness. It immediately starts telling, this is impossible. You feel something wrong. You imagine it all. They have instilled that into you. You've been deceived. It's only me who's fair. Well, you have to become a sub-personality. Guys, when you listen to such things, later on, don't say that God is unfair. Right. This is also from the topic of the paranormal, that people describe various states of the clinical death while exactly such a state is often described and popularized that a person so light that he felt blissful, nice, comfortable, joyful and bright. So there are precisely such brightest and nicest epithets. However, even patients themselves are often too modest in expressing their feelings when they have experienced some hellish sensations burning in fire. All this is actually very simple. There is a primary state after the state of the physical body death, mm -hmm. when polar structures break away, so to say, consciousness, personality, and so on, from the material structure, then primary liberation from the physical body is felt as a bright light and freedom Physical pressure disappears. After all, as a matter of fact, while residing in the structure, both consciousness and personality experience pressure, experience closedness. Meaning, we don't perceive this because we are accustomed to exist this way. Well, just imagine, you are walking with a backpack. You are born, you wear a backpack, and bricks are gradually added there. You are walking and don't notice. It's an inalienable part of yours. Then hop, the backpack is removed. What will you feel? Lightness. Lightness, freedom. Relief. And these very colors are exactly at the primary breakaway. When people are resuscitated and brought back during the primary breakaway, everything is always in glowing colors for them. But when they go a little farther, a little farther the reality begins. Those who were successfully resuscitated from there, who went a little bit farther. There, the colors already assume natural shades. There, subpersonality already begins. There is pressure and all the rest there. Well, certainly, those who moved, let's say, to the angel side, if they went a little farther, those ones cannot be resuscitated. Why? Having gained freedom, they will never return. To pull him out, when a person has spent a long time in clinical death, for example, it's possible to pull him from that side, even after a long period of time, only when he is destined to be a sub-personality. While those who are called saints, if they have really achieved the angelic fusion, it's really extremely difficult to resuscitate them. Well, I don't remember such cases when it would be successful. They don't return. It is interesting, if possible, to the topic of clinical death and what happens in coma, because a coma is also described that there is happiness or unhappiness. There are they... But it's the same, as we have said. These are vegetative states, far and wide. In the state of a coma, a total disconnection of personality from primary consciousness can happen. Months can pass for a person, whereas at that level, it's an instant. So here, the issue is somewhat well, yes, yeah, so they don't reach hell, these hellish sufferings. Well, naturally. That is, it's an ordinary state, the state of that very sleep and rest, meaning of disconnection. Every part exists separately. But when they are together, when they are nourished, let's say, by the attention of consciousness, then a person is active, while in this case, he's inactive, like during sleep. And that's it. Therefore, there is no memory of what was happening.
And if there is memory, then these people go into magic later on. Well, into magic. This is always so. It's just that consciousness often draws up all sorts of games later on. After all, consciousness has heard a lot. It wants to do magic to draw attention to itself, and it uses this as a manipulation for drawing attention to its own persona. Again, it needs not so much the attention of people around as the attention of personality in the first place. It begins to tell what was happening as well as all sorts of speculations and mindsets from the system. There are also questions regarding personality. It is said that consciousness has an instinct of self-preservation, which is actually based on fear. Does personality have any instinct of self-preservation, no. for instance, on the antipode of fear and love? No. You should understand that these are different things. Consciousness clearly understands. Consciousness is a part of the system. Well, primary consciousness also has an instinct of self-preservation. Secondary consciousness has a distinct instinct of self-preservation. In primary consciousness, it is less distinct, but it is still distinct. Yet, here again, under the dictation of secondary consciousness, a person can do stupid things. You and I have already discussed this. Like when he is hanging on one arm on a crane taking a selfie. Why? Pridefulness prevails even over the instinct of self-preservation. Consciousness takes even such risk in order to attract someone's attention, to get a good feed. These are foolish things. Whereas personality doesn't have an instinct of self-preservation as such. It has an aspiration. However, aspiration isn't an instinct of self-preservation. Why? Because in terms of the instinct of self-preservation in the struggle for life in this case, Consciousness certainly wins. Why? Because it has a clear understanding of the material world. And it has an understanding. The primary one has a poorly developed one. The secondary one has a clear understanding of what subpersonality is and everything else. This is already a part of the system. And it clearly understands this. And it understands its program, what it must do so that personality, God forbid, doesn't become an immortal angel, because it's a loss for them. For them, it's for primary consciousness. It's a total death. For the secondary one, it is also a huge loss. It's unprofitable. While personality understands its aspiration, it has a feeling of home. It has a feeling of justice and joy. It has a feeling of life, which it strives for. However, it perceives this world solely to the dictation of primary consciousness. That's the problem. Yet, in fact, this is really fair, the choice. After all, you do feel. And feelings are strikingly different from emotions and from consciousness, from what consciousness dictates. Well, it's like air and earth, let's say. That is, the solid, rough material and the airy, well, the difference is huge. Yes, in the context of what you've said above about the state of clinical death, people are also confused about the issue of pain. Who feels pain? Personality or consciousness? Personality perceives pain, but it is precisely consciousness, primary consciousness, that feels and experiences pain. The secondary one doesn't, the primary one does. Why? Because the main impulse comes precisely onto it. However, it focuses the attention of personality who perceives pain. Yet perceives doesn't mean that it experiences or feels it. But this signal closely and directly interacts mostly with our body, with our pain. What is pain? Let's figure this out. It's a signal, an electrical signal, an impulse. And what does this impulse lead to? To a stronger or weaker excitation of a certain group of neurons. This is perceived by primary consciousness. It is primary consciousness that feels it. But it's enough to interfere again with that very hypnosis and pain disappears, right? Let's just recall, for example, why go far? That very Kasparovsky. When a person simply doesn't feel pain under hypnotic influence, 27 stitches, pardon me, this is pretty serious. Abdominal surgery was being conducted, and there was neither pupillary reaction nor mimic reaction. The person was talking, and everything was fine. It was all done on camera, in such an online mode. And he didn't feel any pain. There was no discomfort. What is pain? And here, it's already a good question. Information. An intensively transmitted information, irritating as a threat or not a threat. As soon as the concept of threat is removed, pain subsides to a great extent. Well, again, with the right approach to the concept of pain, it disappears by 80%. Emotional coloring goes away, and pain subsides as soon as a person becomes aware of it while working on himself. Or there is, as they say, habituation to pain. Well, it's impossible to habituate oneself to pain. Why? Because it's an irritant that leads to excitation. The question is, what attitude consciousness has to this, what it interprets. Let me explain this simply. Let's imagine we have a company in which we work. 
We have a director who finances everything, Tatiana. I am, well, let's take a manager, for example. The manager is primary consciousness. Tatiana is personality. She has all the funds. Jana comes and says, here's a product, you need to buy it. Urgently. I need such an amount. As the manager of primary consciousness, I turn to Tatiana and say, look, there is a good product. I urgently need such an amount of money. She gives me money. It's attention. I pass it on to secondary consciousness, well, in this case, and it all has got launched. The wheel has started spinning. We have purchased the goods, then everything else. However, there is another option. Let's say, information comes about the damage of something. Warehouses are on fire. As the manager, I say, Warehouses are on fire. I worry because I'm accountable. I am the manager. I'm financially accountable. For me, it is pain and suffering. Yet, what does she do? She doesn't worry, does she? She has a lot of such companies and warehouses. She doesn't worry too much. I'm very worried. I'm the manager. I'm accountable for this warehouse. Well, for her, it's merely losing a little money. So what do I do? I narrow down her attention. She forgets about other warehouses and begins to help out strenuously. She calls all the firefighters, involves all her connections, she invests all her attention, all the financial resources she has today in order to put out the fire faster. Well, something like that, figuratively. It's not quite clear, well, approximately like that. Interesting. Moreover, Igor Mihailovich, people also ask questions regarding spiritual development, that when you simply reject various negative thoughts and negativity in general, this feeling with the Holy Spirit happen then? Or does the spiritual development of a person, of personality, take place in such case? No. Wait. Everything is very simple. You reject all negative thoughts, right? But what thoughts do you keep? It's impossible to eliminate this flow of thoughts, right? It's the same as to forbid the wind to blow. It will still blow, right? So, is switching to something good only an initial stage? Absolutely right. Switching to something good, and here, what do you switch to, and what do you strive for? This is what everything begins with. In order for a person, let's say, to really develop spiritually, well, spiritual development is what? It is nothing but filling with the Holy Spirit, as you say, right? What is necessary? It's necessary to work in this direction, meaning to put the power of one's attention not only into positive thoughts, but there should also be actions. There should be movement, movement on the left side of the table, right? That's when you will get filled. But if you are just sitting and doing nothing, pardon me, you remain in the same point as you were while the exit is there. Hence, you have to move on. Therefore, just to eliminate negative thoughts doesn't mean to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, again, let's approach the point that a person, so to say, in any person, there is a particle of the Holy Spirit, there is life in him. While life in him is eternal, it's the soul. Partially, there is temporary life as well. But temporary life is also supported by means of what? Prana, Allah, and everything else. So, no matter what we say, all this, the source is still the same, right? Meaning power and God's love. Also, Igor Mihailovich, we would like to ask a question regarding perception through feelings, because we encounter the fact that people often confuse what perception through feelings actually is. They say that, yes, I have a very strong and deep perception through feelings. Strong and deep. A very strong intuition. I feel other people. I was born with a gut feeling. Right. I was born with a gut feeling. I feel everything. I feel and understand other people. Now, let's begin. If he feels and understands other people, again, at the level of what? At the level of primary consciousness, at the level of secondary consciousness, by means of which he has this, or from the position of personality. After all, this is easily determined. When it, pardon me, occurs openly, when it occurs from the spiritual position, when he feels a person as he is, so to say. First of all, generally speaking, this perception occurs more at the energy structural level, not at the material one. Well, a different thing is when a person, let's say, is in negativity. Again, he actually perceives and feels it all from the position of primary consciousness and under its assessment. And there is a clear differentiation here. What he feels and what kind of gut feeling he has developed since childhood, as you say. Although many people, even not many, but all people, perceive the world more through feelings, and later on, they exactly get accustomed to the predominant position 
of perception by consciousness. Right. There is also such a point that people themselves can invest in what they supposedly felt, and later on it came true because they had believed in this. Well, and we again go back to magic. These are already games of consciousness. Yes, yeah, sure. He had felt, it came true, and the game started. I feel, it comes true. I don't feel, it doesn't come true. Well, all these are games after all. Right. Or the topic of superstitions. You know, people also ask questions that they sort of already understand that, in fact, what you invest in is what you get. However, they cannot get rid of superstitions, meaning like how to act. A black cat crossed his path. Well, again, the point is that superstitions are also part of a tradition, and a cat crosses your path. Yes, exactly. You know and understand everything, but just in case, as they say, you spit over your shoulder, hold a button on your jacket, close your eyes or something else, or you wait until someone passes first. Well, this is more such a level of traditions. It's not magic. It's already more of a game. Well, there are people who really live by these. They look for signs. Well, Miracles. Right, some miracles and everything else. Manifestations. Yet, who prompts them in such cases? Consciousness. Meaning, this, you know, as they say... Again, all traditions are set at the level of a child. Our lifelong child is primary consciousness. All these are its imprints, its games. Well, there's nothing terrible here in principle. He can play if he wants to. The main thing is that even when a person, let's say, gains freedom from the system, he perfectly understands a cat is a cat. Why do you care which way and how it walks? But consciousness wants him to close his eyes or wait until someone passes first. Well, these are its problems, problems of consciousness, whereas you can drive peacefully. There is another question about materialization of creatures who are kind of not alive. But people gather for spiritualistic seances and summon not just spirits, but precisely the materialization of a creature takes place. Well, there is no difference. How is it that not just spirits or something else? Indeed, let's imagine. There have gathered people who put the power of their attention, with high concentration at that, into something to manifest itself. So, will a dead man or anyone's subpersonality really manifest itself or something and come in contact with them? No. Well, naturally, such manifestations do take place, but there must be, as they say, powerful mediums. They should be interesting for the system. If it is interesting and beneficial for the system, then yes, certain manifestation might occur, which even appear at the metaphysical level. Although, for the most part, these are simply games, illusionists, and all the rest. But it happens in reality as well. Actually, if we are to touch upon the topic of manifestation of, let's say, various entities or something else, phantoms, yes. which can manifest themselves, the topic of phantoms is interesting too. Yes. Can people create a phantom? They can. But there is a certain law. There must be a certain number of people, excuse me. It's not five or seven people who are sitting at a table but many more. They must invest their attention at such a concentrated level so that this particular image would arise. They must make maximum efforts for its manifestation, and then it can really form. However, as a rule, a phantom is not a material structure, it is rather a manifestation of subtle matter. And it will definitely exist at their expense, meaning this is a kind of an agreement. Well, for example, we would like how does this work? I'll simply explain. A necessary number of us have gathered, no fewer. It's possible with a greater number and not with a fewer one. I'm not saying how many, otherwise people will play with it. Although, one can find these practices described. They are described in more detail in Tibetan literature. What's the point? We'd like to make a god for ourselves, or sort of a genie. And we begin to focus our attention on it with certain characteristics of it. For example, We'd like to have an assistant, Mickey Mouse, that is, a little mouse. The most interesting thing is that in a while, literally, everyone who was engaged in this process of creation and were extremely focused on it, those who were just sitting, watching and doing nothing, for those it wouldn't work. Whereas those who were making a really good input would start noticing lots of mice appearing around them. And out of the blue, mice would start showing up this would manifest. These are the first manifestations that this begins to work. Then there is more. They have gathered again. Some input is made. There are material requests as if to a genie, and somehow something might be achieved. Somewhere might start working. Things deemed impossible might come true, but it's all in the material world. If this is pleasing and beneficial for the system, such things do exist. But one needs to understand that it's a direct path to subpersonality because you pay for it with your life, because someone, but not you, will live instead of you. That's why they say, 
This mustn't be done. It's unacceptable. It won't give anything good, eventually, because everything that you acquire here at the right side of the table will remain here. You won't take anything with you. Subpersonality loses everything except for memories and all the filth of life. Yes, and when you receive the knowledge, there is such a moment when you begin to doubt such optical illusions. Yet, what do people really see? Nothing. It's the same illusion. But it exists. And here, even those very Brahmins might probably be right about some things, when they created gods, whom to pray to, whom not to pray to, because, indeed, they created an illusion, such as you say, an optical illusion, which, like that very mouse, started to exist a little bit. But what kind of god is that? It's an illusion, it's not even a genie. It's an interesting point about the fact that consciousness constantly demands some miracles from a person. Consciousness always demands, of course. And at the same time, it doubts all the time. It doesn't demand it from a person, but it demands it from God. It makes a person demand proof from God. Can God be incarnated in a human being at all? No, of course not. In order to understand, let's go back to our chamomile, okay? Can you, dear friends, those who really imagine the chamomile in our experiment, and there, as we have already said, there is some kind of a little bug sitting somewhere under the pistol. Can you put yourself into that bug? And now, those who have such questions, imagine, how are you going to put everything that is infinite and boundless into the finite and mortal? The infinite, boundless and immortal into the finite, small, and mortal. However, consciousness will immediately say, God is omnipotent, he can do anything. But in this case, you too were omnipotent. You imagined a chamomile with little bugs running on it. Haven't you created an illusory life in your mind for a moment? You have created the existence of a chamomile with some bugs. And because of this, consciousness starts playing. The system itself begins to manipulate a person, to manipulate the flow of such thoughts, to drive a person into a dead end. Well, a person meaning a personality. In fact, personality is always on the spiritual path. But why does it usually finance the formation of a subpersonality of itself? Exactly these sorts of questions, these sorts of suggestions, these sorts of misunderstandings. God is omnipotent, he can do anything, he can even appear. Get incarnated, yes. I remember there was a cartoon where a wizard who was big and strong was tricked. He says, Can you turn into a mouse? It was Puss in Boots. He says, of course I can, I'm an omnipotent wizard. So the cat says, I don't believe you. Well, you can easily turn into an ogre, but what about a little mouse? The wizard turned into a mouse and the cat just ate it. Well, perhaps in the same way the system wants God to get incarnated and manifested in some person or in something material, something small, so that it consumes him. Well, this is unrealistic, it's so stupid and funny. There was a question when you were saying that God cannot be incarnated in a body. I recalled various ancient religions where it is said that gods were incarnated in a body. Well, it turns out that what did they mean? Well, generally speaking, can representatives of the spiritual world be incarnated in a body? That is, if God cannot, then what about representatives of the spiritual world? Any manifestation of representatives of the spiritual world in the material world may occur solely in a body. However, instead of a soul, personality, let's say, and so on, in the ordinary mode, there comes the one who is called an angel, just like that. Or there is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit instead of personality and a soul. So it turns out that... However, God cannot. There is a huge difference. You shouldn't confuse God and His Messenger. While the Holy Spirit is also an executor, of God's will. He acts solely by His will. There is also the following question. Why do holy people, when they reach a certain state of this unity with the spiritual world, why do they not describe what is happening on this threshold? On the threshold? Of fusion with the spiritual world. But consciousness won't notice this, and there is nothing to compare with. Well, let's say, after a person has really attained life and fusion, does consciousness cease to bark? No. 
It's just that clear separation takes place. It interprets all these moments in its own way. Of course. And here, absolute control over consciousness already begins, meaning personality finances only what is necessary. And for consciousness, this is extremely unprofitable, and it will never promote this. There is also such an interesting point. Such expressions are found in people's vocabulary. For example, that by merging with an image, personality loses its self-identification. That by merging with consciousness, personality… Wait, let's analyze what personality is. Personality merges with an image. Personality cannot merge with an image. It merges with an image when it becomes a sub-personality. That's when its merging with an image takes place. Well, images are begotten in our brain even not in consciousness. In consciousness, pardon me, it's a radio wave. Nothing is begotten in it. It's a banal set and pattern, let's say, of some programs, merely that. Whereas an image is generated by the brain, the picture which we perceive, and primary consciousness can operate with this picture, providing it to personality as a fact of what is happening here. Why is it easy to deceive a person? For instance, he is in a state of hypnosis, semi-hypnosis, we have touched upon that, it doesn't matter. He is given an onion and told that it's an apple, and the person is eating the onion, and it seems to him that he's eating an apple. Then he is asked, how is it? He says, yes, it's very tasty, it's a good sweet apple. Well, meanwhile, he is eating the onion and doesn't perceive it at all. Why? Because personality doesn't care at all. It feels neither taste nor anything. It's primary consciousness that feels it all. However, if an operator enters, meaning someone third, who connects and can, let's say, make primary consciousness sleepy, then the body will eat even an onion, while personality will perceive information that something tasty is being eaten, and it will simply finance it. But it cannot merge with an image. It is detached from an image through primary consciousness. Right. People also ask such a question. Is it possible to get filled through programs, that is, people... To get filled with what? To get filled with some energy, to acquire some power. It's like to charge a battery or something else. Yes, exactly. Something like that. Well, let's put it this way. Digital media can transfer those impulses, those states, or let's say, those a lot powers, that can actually, if a person is open and ready to receive them, they can strengthen the position, or fortify the position of personality in front of the system. They can. But this is an impetus. This doesn't mean that he has been given an additional charge, given power by which he can withstand. It's an impetus, and it lasts for a short period of time. But to use this power, after all, many of our friends try to act this way, Having felt, having got filled up, obtained freedom to the dictation of consciousness, they immediately begin to try to use this for magic, for moving objects, influencing someone, or they spend it on improving their body health. Or on mundane magic, right? Try mundane magic, yes. Often people actually use it all. They watch the programs in order to improve their health, something else, because they feel easier, better. Why easier and better? It's a direct impact. Of course, it can... It's not hypnosis or suggestion, guys. In this case, the impact takes place. This is what we call the spiritual powers, a lot powers, or what the Holy Spirit is called in religions, something else, meaning it's replenishment. This has nothing to do with hypnosis or suggestion or anything else, so that no one could use our words reversely. We don't influence anyone. We don't have such a goal. We just weaken the influence of consciousness on personality a little bit, not more. Consciousness perceives information as a threat, perceives that power which is a threat to it. Therefore, it does everything possible to maintain its influence in dictatorship over personality. It directly opposes it. However, there are many more people who, on the contrary, as personalities, understand during the programs, even perceive our nonverbal communication, they strengthen their position as personalities in relation to the system, to consciousness, and to everything else. After all, there are many more of such people, thank God. And thanks to the fact that such people are there, we make our programs precisely for them. Let's say, we have no purpose to free anyone from the system slavery. Those who drove themselves there, it is their choice. Our goal is just to help those who really strive for spiritual liberation, 
but not more. There is such a question that it is always said that there will be the end of the world. There are even lists of doomsday dates which were foreseen happened. Well, this is inevitable. In any case, the material world is temporary. It will happen someday in any case. Yes, but the concept is exactly that they say the end of the world, but they don't say the end of darkness. Well, this is natural. It's a twist from whom? The twist goes from the system itself. But here, if we think it over correctly, what is light? In this interpretation, light is understood as the source of life. And when the source of life stops, coming into this imagined chamomile, it just ceases to exist. Nothing more than that. Well, the end of darkness means the prevalence of light, even in the material structure. That is, in such a structure as our universe, or pardon me, at least as our planet, right? Well, ideally, the universe on the whole. By the way, regarding the point that there should be more light, there are a lot of questions also about the Holy Spirit, because people realize that His role is tremendous, and that Personality is a part of the Holy Spirit, and the role of the Holy Spirit is great in terms of development of a person as an angel. Therefore, there is a train of misunderstandings, questions, and a desire to find out more about this. In particular, the first question is as follows. People got confused. There is a human spirit, and there is the Holy Spirit. A human spirit is sort of cold. It should constantly be warmed up. There is just no understanding of what a human spirit is, what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit, is it personality or not? No. Because there are a lot of energy. Is it personality, God? Wait, no. The Holy Spirit cannot be a personality. Personality is personality. Personality is half alive and half dead. Mm -hmm. Personality is that which is not yet, it is self-determining, but at the same time, it is not existent yet. It is temporarily residing, while the Holy Spirit is eternal. It's an integral part of the spiritual world. Generally speaking, let's just determine, let's remind what the Holy Spirit is. It is God's power. And what is God's power in? In His love. So who is the Holy Spirit? It is what we call Alatra. It is God's love, that which gives life, that which gives joy and endlessness and the boundlessness of existence of, let's say, the spiritual world. What is the greatest gift of the Holy Spirit? Life. Because a lot of… Life is the only gift that is given to a human from the Holy Spirit. It's a prospect of His life. It is temporary existence and a prospect of His life eternal. It is life. It's just that there are also such delusions that it is necessary to sit and wait for the Holy Spirit, that He will surely come, that He will fill your heart, that He will act and create. It's enough just to have faith, yes? To sit and wait, and He will do everything instead of you. Yes, and He will do it instead of you. He will come, He will choose you, but it's not you. Again, we are back to what? Desires from consciousness, for someone to come. If God doesn't come, let at least the Holy Spirit come, right? Again. They have a division of it all, division of the One, of the boundless and the whole One. God is the spiritual world. He is boundless. He is eternal. It is that which consciousness is even unable to imagine. And what is the Holy Spirit? It's the acting power of God. It is what we call the will of God. Well, that's exactly the Holy Spirit. It's a constituent, an integral part of the spiritual world. It is the executive force of God. Let's put it so. However, there are actually rules as well. A person's choice, if a person doesn't strive and doesn't act with the aim of gaining life eternal, then how can, pardon me, the Holy Spirit come to him, sit down and say, wait, don't listen to Satan, listen to me, what I will tell you, right? But at the same time, isn't it the Holy Spirit that acts through those very prophets? Let's say, those who are sent here from the spiritual world, so that they give people an opportunity to gain life eternal. Isn't that very knowledge actually given by His will? Let's say, the knowledge which consciousness or the system constantly destroys in people? If we look at the history of humankind, we will see indirect confrontation between the spiritual world and the world of darkness. This is not the fight of light with darkness. Light never fights with darkness. Where light appears, 
darkness disappears. However, it's impossible for light to manifest itself in a human against his will. Well, not will, but rather choice. A human has the right to choose between life and death. This right was given by God so that the worthy, strong ones, those who choose him, come into life, while those who choose the mortal, the betrayers of God, gain death, gain torments, or subpersonality, or something else. Everything is absolutely fair and absolutely honest. That's how it should be. But people wished for this a while ago, didn't they? They wanted to come to the spiritual world as mature beings, equals among equals. It's the choice of people. If flesh cannot give such states as joy, only the presence of this spirit in a person can give these benefits, benefits in the form of love and joy. Name at least one living human being in whom the Holy Spirit is not present. The existence of personality and soul results from the presence of his smaller part. Why? Because this is what gives us life. This is an inherent part, after all. What contribution of the person himself is, the choice of the person himself is important indeed, because… Absolutely. And now you are exactly answering this question. Everything happens by the human choice. Everything will be by his choice. If he strives for life, he will get filled. Again, I'll bring a simple example. The closer personality is to the spiritual world, the more love it gets. The more it gets filled with the Holy Spirit the more joy and love it perceives, the more it is surrounded with affection, and the more it is protected. However, these are his own efforts. These are the efforts of the person himself. He doesn't invest in the inevitably dead, in the inevitably false, in that which, pardon me, he won't take along with him. But he invests in what will always be with him. He invests in his life. He invests his attention, the most valuable resource. He invests time of his temporary existence here. And everything is banal. The percentage, everything is calculated easily, like in mathematics. It should be clear to you as the director, going back to our example, while I am just a manager. Right. You have exactly answered the question that people ask. How to stay in the Spirit constantly? How to keep… Not to leave Him and not to drive Him away. Again, when does the Holy Spirit leave a person? Well. He never leaves him completely. But let's say, the excess always goes away as soon as a person turns to Satan. One cannot commune simultaneously, excuse me, with both the spiritual world and the inevitably dead world. A human is dual, but he unequivocally belongs either to the dead or to the alive. And if a person, let's say, wants to be both here and there, well, such things won't happen, it won't work. But consciousness says that it is possible. Yes, it's possible to live as you want and at the same time to acquire life eternal. Such a thing doesn't happen. Right. Another question is precisely about the fact that people want both things and they are keen on either this or that. And such a question also… Again, when a person is keen on the spiritual, he forms a subpersonality of himself because keenness is akin to entertainment. He plays it, but doesn't live. While well, playing is Satan's tricks. If a person plays at spirituality, he won't advance anywhere and will never save himself. Never. So, passionate keenness is actually an addiction. Again, keenness is a game. A game. And a game isn't life. Whereas, it is necessary to live by the spiritual world. You are not keen on breathing, are you? And why? Try to be keen on it for a while and then find something else to be keen on and don't breathe, and we'll see how long your body will exist. The same is with the spiritual world, with gaining of this God's love or filling with the Holy Spirit. This happens exactly when a person invests his attention there, when it's as important for him as an inhale for a body, just as oxygen is important for the body. In the same way, the Holy Spirit must be important for personality, constant communication, permanent contact, then yes, everything will be set. Here, as I understand, such a substitution comes from consciousness that a person sort of says, I'll be keen on the spiritual in order not to be keen on something material, costly material, meaning this… Well, as a rule, this originates from the internal. 
from the personality's need, while substitutions come from consciousness, meaning consciousness sends a person where it is ostensibly spiritual, while in fact it is banal games. But it says, well, it has always been here. It has. There are also the grains and everything else. But then again, a person was keen on something. And afterwards, consciousness asked him, what did it give you? You engaged in. Consciousness always trolls, even those who seriously start engaging in the spiritual. Yet what have you acquired? What has it given you? What have you learned? Can you move a mountain? Forget the mountain. Move at least a grain of sand. Wait, how is that? A person is still nobody and nothing. But consciousness already begins to test his spirituality. Spirituality is not magic. Magic is the domain of the system itself. It's the system's world where particles move. Well, again, they move by God's will. Let's say if light is taken out of darkness, darkness will disappear. I mean, in this case, it's precisely God's power that generated this entire material world like a chamomile. Everything will disappear instantly. Simply, it is often said that when a person abides in the Holy Spirit, or when a person is already saved thanks to the Holy Spirit, then a seal of the Holy Spirit is placed upon him. What is the seal of the Holy Spirit? Well, in this case, the seal of the Holy Spirit means to be chosen by the Holy Spirit. It can be attributed to this. Sometimes it happens that a person receives it for his merits, again, for his merits before the spiritual world. He still, being shaky, neither understanding the spiritual world nor having studied the material world, but feeling that something needs to be done, right? He does something not for himself, but for humanity, depriving himself of some enormous benefits in the material world. And he does it with a pure heart, by feeling. Then he can receive, again, if his contribution to the spiritual, let's say, development of society is huge. He can receive the so-called safeguard seal or the seal of the Holy Spirit. This means that if he doesn't betray God in the future, his future will be good. Is it possible to upset the Holy Spirit? People also ask themselves this question. Of course, it's possible. Easily. Let's just say, it is very easy to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be in dialogue with Him, to be in spiritual connection with Him. Well, but it's also easy to sadden Him and to lose Him. It's enough to simply betray and turn to the mortal. Everything is very simple. Also, often the Holy Spirit, even always actually, in the scriptures, He is identified with fire, or that it is either a shaft of light and fire. This is, again, compared with some visual effects of His manifestation in the material world. But it has to be understood, again, what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is not a person or a unit. It's an actum force. And everyone perceives him in their own way. And when a person gets filled or perceives communication with him, well, then consciousness itself can visually draw a certain image of influence. In a certain image of influence, that which destroys matter, it is always associated with fire, with destruction. Hence the fire, the fire that is blazing, but not burning. So it is such an association that which consciousness perceives as a manifestation, let's say, a greater manifestation of the Holy Spirit in contact with the Personality. After all, the Holy Spirit doesn't come into contact with consciousness. Here it also becomes clear why it was written in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit in principle and worlds are destroyed by fire. So, the spiritual power is such that the material fades and is nothing compared to this inner fire. Well, it's just a power which gives rise to the worlds in which takes them. Regarding spiritual practices and everyday life in general, when it was voiced that God sort of doesn't see a person before this person becomes an angel, and this feeling… Well, but he never leaves him either. Yes, he doesn't leave him. And what do you understand? Simply before I classified this feeling in myself as I feel God, but then I realized that I actually couldn't feel Him, because He didn't see me. So it turns out that I feel the Holy Spirit. While meaning this feeling inside, people feel… The spiritual world, let's say so. They don't feel God, but they sort of feel the spiritual world and the Holy Spirit. And here again, interpretation and separation from consciousness started. What is the spiritual world? It's a multitude of angels' love. And here's the answer. It's a multitude in unity and unity in multitude. And who do you think God is? 
It's just that, as far as understood, that sort of directly, as long as you are not a spiritual being, you cannot come into contact with him directly, meaning you can only come into contact with him through the Holy Spirit. Is it not so? What does personality come into contact with on the path? With the Holy Spirit, it turns out. Of course, it comes into contact with the Holy Spirit, with the spiritual world, and the like. And pardon me, if I hear your speech, do I hear you or whom? And what is the Holy Spirit when He communicates with you? It's a speech that God Himself pronounces. If He sends you His love, His Holy Spirit, whose love is this? God's. God's love, it turns out. Who else? And here, exactly, when you send love to God, it is of course, the Holy Spirit who perceives it. But He is precisely the intermediary who doesn't take anything for Himself. He passes everything to the one whom you send it to. These words you said were certainly very strong that exactly intermediaries consume, whereas the Holy Spirit is this absolute transfer of love directly from the spiritual world to a person and from a person to God. But again, why? Now, if I tell you I love you, can you hear me? Yes. Who is talking? I am talking. Yes. And who hears? You hear. Yes. You hear it again by means of what? Voice. Speech, yes. Right. So, the voice of God is exactly the Holy Spirit. And God's hearing is, again, the Holy Spirit. Love is a tool for dialogue with God. That's right. Therefore, when a person says that he loves God, God hears him let's say, through the Holy Spirit. Well, that's when a person already becomes worthy for the Holy Spirit to communicate with him. So, my friends, let us live in such a way that the Holy Spirit always abounds in us, so that we never know death. Let's simply love each other. Let's simply become a part of the spiritual world, its inseparable part. Thanks for your attention.